Blood Brothers Podcast, a Five Pillars Production. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my dear brothers, sisters, friends, and the foes out there, and welcome to another episode of the Blood Brothers Podcast with your host, Didi Hussein. Before I introduce today's esteemed guest, I want you to subscribe to this channel and I want you to like the video, leave a comment and share it. Today's guest, as is like all the other guests, is special. But this is someone who is intimately special for me. Uh, more so because I've had the great honour and pleasure of working very closely alongside this brother who is a veteran in the Dawah scene. But even besides that, he is one of the most busiest bodies I know in terms of the various activities that he does for the Muslim community on various levels. And I guess today's podcast, we will be looking at all those various things our dear brother and the guest is involved with. And that is none other than Jamal J. Richards from Nightscape Productions. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum well, First of all, I'd like to say, alhamdulillah, I made it to... Uh Blood Brothers, I made it on the podcast. <laughs> Mashallah. Congratulations, bro. That said, yeah. I saw you, I saw your podcast pop up uh with on, on another platform. And I was like, Raw, why is that popping up? And why isn't Jamal has why hasn't you been on yet? But wallahi, you're on the list to come on. But it's just that that triggered me to be like, nah, he needs to come on quick. And obviously the viewers and listeners should know that this is a take two of the podcast. Take two, unfortunately. Yeah, B- yeah because the first time you said you've ever lost files, right? Yeah. Well, we were on a very busy um, filming trip. We were indeed. And uh, yeah, so it was kind of like, it, it wasn't an afterthought to record it, but it was at a time where it had been a really busy day. So I thought I had the footage safe on my SD card. But the following day, I had to go out and do some very, very um, critical filming. Yeah. And I had to format the card. So I you do sh- apologise for sh- that. You sure the files didn't go missing because the content of the first, the first take? was... Yeah, it was very. Uh, mm. Well, let's see. Yeah. Let's see if you can replicate some of that. Yeah. Yeah. Before we get into uh, the crux of today's podcast, uh, as with most episodes, I want to present you a scenario. Okay. Um, it's basically you just have to pick one of the two, uh, and I can't take a fifty-fifty or nah. I can't. You have to choose one, Jamal. Yeah. Okay. You ready for this? Yeah. Sure. I don't think it's anything that's challenging, but nevertheless, I think it's interesting for the viewers and listeners to get to know who I've got on board. Um, I know you're a man who uh, generally drinks coffee either only with or mostly with uh, oat milk, mm-hmm. right? You don't have uh, dairy milk. Dairy, no. no. But let's say there was no oat milk uh, and you had to choose between almond or coconut milk for your coffee. Coconut milk. Cool. Have you ever tried coffee with an almond milk? I think I did, yeah. It was just watery. It's Nasty, yeah? Yeah, it's disgusting, yeah. Cool. Uh, I know you're a man who's also very wary about carb intake. But if you had to choose between one... So right now... Nah, I can't see it, bruv. Can't see you looking... Mashallah, sorry. Do you know how much effort it takes to suck a stomach in for a whole podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I ain't gonna lie. I'm not even gonna mess around, bro. <laughs> was that, was it's like, I'm surprised I'm able to still maintain <laughs> my pitch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's an exercise in of itself, but you're burning it's calories. Exercise. That's what they say, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. But what yeah. I was going to say was uh, bread or rice? Bread or rice. Mm. If you had to choose between one of the two in terms of a, a staple <clears> for <throat> your carb. I guess I'd have to say rice. Rice, yeah. yeah. So if you compared like biryani and that to like naan and roti, it would still be like rice, yeah? Yeah, I love naan. Yeah. I love is. roti. Um, but I suppose rice is a bit more flexible, isn't it? You could do more things with it. Uh, so. w- you're originally from Jamaica, right? Yeah. So rice rolls more them, yeah? It's rice, yeah. And we got Jamaican roti. And then no. you got roti. And yeah. you got Jamaican roti, which is, is different, but it's wicked stuff, man. But did they, get, did they get the name from the subcontinent roti? I don't even know. But I'd say, okay, maybe. Cool. Maybe. But it's completely different the way you make it, though. It's made with... Um, I think split peas. Yeah. And they're sort of ground. And it's really delicious. And what, do you, what would you eat with mainly? Just like the same, like a curry. Okay. A Jamaican curry and stuff. Could you have it with goat curry? Yeah. Yeah, you could. When was the last time you had goat curry? Ooh, long time ago. Yeah, very long time ago. Because it's not like, it's not standard. Cool. Uh, the last time I actually had goat was in 2014 in Africa. Wow. Uh, on the tour that I was doing with um, Ayera. Cool. Yeah, and that was really nice. But that was the last time I had goat. What's aki fish like? 
Aki is... Uh, we don't ask because like, Aki always says it when he's here. Your brother, yeah, yeah it's, 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 Aki is not a fish, but saltfish. Aki yeah. and saltfish. Aki and saltfish. Yeah, Aki is actually a fruit. Okay. Uh, and it's a weird fruit because it's delicious. It looks like scrambled eggs. Okay. Um, you can only eat it once the fruit has ripened and opened up. Cool. And if you don't wait until that time, it's actually poisonous. You die from it. All right. Which begs the question, like, who was the first person to find that out? Yeah. And who was the fool yeah. afterwards to sort yeah. of think, like, oh, I'm going to try it. Yeah, I'm going to try it. And then let yeah. man know that I'm going to about to die as well. It's madness, but that's <laughs> the thing. But that's what it is of Aki, yeah. So cool. you have to wait until it opens and then, then it's safe to eat. But Aki is delicious, though. It's like a very delicate sort of, uh, um, it's a fruit, but you wouldn't see it as a fruit. Chicken or red meat? I suppose health conscious wise, I'd say chicken. But you like the red, yeah? Yeah, I like the red meat, yeah. Cool. Um, I know you're someone who's also obviously uh, whether you are still this active. I know that you were very active in in, in health consciousness. Yeah. Uh, if you had to stick to one exercise, would it be press ups or crunches? It'd be press ups because um, it has more physical benefits. Um, more compound. More compound, yeah. But you know, as you know, my favorite exercise is burpees. Burpees, yeah. yeah. Uh, but 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 the one that's most needed at the moment, you would say, is crunches. Most needed is crunches, yeah. yeah. <laughs> however, however, crunches on their own, yeah. you, you're not really going to get that much benefit, isn't it? Because you can't spot burn. But if, I, su- I suppose, like, you know, for peace of mind, I'm telling yeah. myself, yeah, I'm doing crunches. Cause, <laughs> but, yeah, press-ups is actually more beneficial. I know that you're someone who's also done Wing Chun mm-hmm. before, right? Uh, you have a box before. Not, not, um, I've not, not done boxing training apart from when I was really, really young. So you choose Wing Chun over boxing? I would choose Wing Chun over boxing, yeah. Is that from the perspective of a personal preference or one that you'd recommend those who are going into kind of combat training? Or Wing or Chun martial training? Um, is absolutely um, more beneficial in many, many ways. You think so? Yeah. More than boxing? I'd say it's more beneficial than boxing. Boxing is very, very good. In actual fact, when I'm doing a home workout, um, I tra- when I train, I train using uh, boxing, boxing circuits. Yeah, boxing circuits because um, cardio wise, it's very good. Because Wing Chun is basically really based on technique. Mm. Um, so that means that if you're going to go to train at a Wing Chun school, they you, you're expected to do your circuits and stuff elsewhere, then come in and just learn, you know, mm. the essentials. Um, but what you learn in Wing Chun, the application and stuff like that. Um, and bearing in mind that Wing Chun was developed by a woman, um, it means that how you do of an, uh, an opponent is, it, it really does kind of have a lot more benefit. You know, for example, when it comes to boxing, if, uh, you know, if you're someone who's light framed, you can still take somebody out, of course, but mm-hmm. your, your, your kind of like your thought pattern would be to try to knock somebody out. But mm-hmm. how are you going to knock somebody out who's a lot heavier than you? Mm-hmm. You're not going to do that. So that means you're going to give them your best punch. Um, but at the end of it, they're still going to probably be, probably be standing. And then mm. what do you do then? But you're saying Wing Chun overcomes it, that. It overcomes that, yeah. It teaches you many different things. It okay. teaches you to use your opponent's weight and strength. Mm. It teaches you to break certain things in certain areas. Mm. So that even as a sort of a more um, vulnerable person, um, you know, you can apply yourself and then get out of the situation. Whereas with boxing, you might punch someone and be like, is that all you got? Mm. And that's the last thing you want to hear when you punch someone yeah, out on definitely. the street and you think, oh, I'm going to be safe now. I think it's also very interesting that you, you got in there that it was founded by a woman in like today's podcast as well. Nice one there, brother. Founded by a woman today's podcast? No, no, you said that Wing Chun was founded by a woman. Yes, yeah, yes. You yes. sipped that in nicely. I sipped it in nicely, yeah. yeah, yeah well, it's a fact, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, we've already uh, noted that you're of Jamaican descent and you're from Jamaica. But if you had to visit one of the two countries uh, outside of Jamaica... Would it be Barbados or Trinidad? Hmm. I'd probably say Trinidad. Have you been to either? No. So so if you had the choice, you'd go to Trinidad over Barbados? I think so, yeah. Why is that? They're both um, beautiful countries, I think. But Trinidad, uh, firstly, it's got a, a Islamic heritage. Okay. Um, and uh, I think that's about it, really. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, as someone who... I spent many years uh, in the Dawa scene, uh, especially with your extensive relationship and involvement with AIRA. Um, and you've seen the various projects and initiatives, uh, the various strategies. Um, 
if you had to choose between as a personal liking in terms yeah. of what you feel is beneficial to you, yeah, would it be dour debates? So like the big debates, don't hate debate, or would it be dour stall where people are at a dour stall and they're engaging with people? So that's an easy one for me. I'd say dour debates because um, I suppose in, during a debate, it's going to be more educational, informative. So you may hear the different arguments and you can apply that somewhere else. Whereas on a dower table, you're going to have people that are going to come up and they might just maybe not be so learned or maybe they might just have a few op- different opinions. Um, so although it would be quite interesting still, but an actual debate, you can sit down and listen to it. I can listen to it all day long. Okay. You know, hence um, you know, my passion for the Don't Hate Debate yeah, franchise. Yeah. How, do you, how do you feel when these conversations are happening in front of you yeah. in real life, let's say, and I, and I know we spoke about this, where you're literally sitting there and listening to various conversations in that recent trip in Lebanon, uh, or whether me and Hamza are talking about something. Uh, how does that come across? Because those are kind of like microscopic versions of debates. Because yeah. intra-Muslim debates, do you find them interesting as well? I find them very interesting. And um, as we discussed before, I'm not ashamed to say, like sometimes, especially on an intellectual level, uh, sometimes a lot of these arguments kind of go over my head. Yeah, that's Hamza for you. Isn't that's it? Hamza, yeah. So, you know, mashallah, Hamza, yeah. he knows. Like I told him as well, mashallah. Yeah. If they had a, a sign language for Hamza's thoughts, it would be yeah. like, yeah. Yeah. Like like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mashallah, may Allah bless him. I mean, I mean, I mean. Um, you're on a boat trip, seven days. Yeah. Uh, you have to choose some companions with you to go with. Uh, you can only choose brothers from one of these true groups. Aiva brothers or Dean Ryder brothers? Yeah, I mean that's a bit of an out of order question, man. That's like it's not an that's, out of order that's question. really that's really unfair. No, it's not unfair. Only because they're both my family. Yeah. So therefore, how can I choose one or the other? It's it's almost impossible. Okay. Um. So if someone if, if someone had a Mac ten to your head and went right, you've got a sick Caribbean boat tour yeah. boat ride. You have to choose brothers from either Aiva or Dean Riders. You're gonna have to choose one because the greater muscle highs for you to preserve your life. So I just refuse choose? to take the choice, man. Or you're just gonna refuse the boat ride itself. I refuse the boat ride. Um, however, if it was like a speedboat, like a sporty speedboat, then yeah. it has to be Dean Riders every okay, day. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But if it's a boat ride on the Dawa mission, yeah, yeah. then okay. I choose Ayera. Oh, All right, okay, you got that one. You got that one. Nicely, cool. All right. Um, same boat ride. Mm-hmm. Same boat ride. Um, taking Abdul Rahim Green or Yusuf Chambers. Oh wow. That's an interesting one. I mean, like, uh, I'd have to say Yusuf because I've travelled more with him. Okay. Yeah, I mean, ARG, mashallah. I've been to... He, see, that's another tough one because we have a, a massive passion for the countryside, right? Um, ARG, so... And he's lived it. He's been there. He's done it with his family and stuff. So uh, if that boat ride were to go somewhere, like, in the wilderness, then definitely 100% ARG. It's the first time I've ever heard of a boat ride going into the countryside. It can do it. Why not? Along the canal, for example, okay. a canal trip down the British Canal or something, going yeah. down to the Lake District or you're, something. You're like finding that. some sneaky ways to get out I've of got these to. Ones. And I hope I'm the, you know, the heads up for anybody else. Okay. This is how you work with uh, <laughs> <laughs> But you said Yusuf first straight away. And you said Dean Ryder's on a speedboat. So, Halas, your yeah. instinctive answers came out first. I don't yeah, care. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Um, obviously, bar, Nightscape Productions, filming, creating content, um, you know, if you had to give that up, and you had to choose one of the two professions to do on a full-time basis, mm. would it be Muslim matchmaking or would it be work, work pertaining to youth and youth reformation and development? The latter. Because I've spent time uh, in the Muslim matchmaking, uh, I think the youth um, development is much more important. So, yeah. Do you think youth development mm. would, ha- if, if you work, if you worked on the youth de- development bit, the matchmaking becomes easier, because then you're dealing with Muslims who have had some level of tarbi or something. Do you see them? Nah. Could, could that work? Nah. Nah. <laughs> okay, we we'll get onto that later. Uh, last one. Um, I era rerouted as a podcast or Blood Brothers as a podcast. Right. Be careful, man. I ain't gonna lie. So I hope you ain't gonna. I ain't gonna lie. So. The original Aira Rerouted podcast um, was really good. It was very informative. But I have more of a personal, um, I suppose, relationship with Blood Brothers 
Because I was there from the beginning. You were there from episode one, my bro. The original intro thing was... All of that, that was you. Mm, uh, yeah, right. and All that, that was you? Yeah, my son. And, and also, like, the, the flow, the, the arm wrestling <laughs> bits and all that kind of stuff. So, for that reason, entertainment-wise, I'm not going to lie, you know, I'd say Blood Brothers. Morsin, how do you feel? Which club podcast? Because you're going to choose Blood Brothers as well. <laughs> However, on top of that, though, I did mention um, that the new Aero rerouted Raw. Oh yeah, get the plug in. As if they don't have enough that subscribers is already. An amazing podcast, right? That the dynamics of that is excellent. The setup looks super serious. The setup is mashallah Muslim. Uh, he's uh, that's his again. The the, the 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 what do you call it? The podcast done. Yeah, he's a Muslim, done. Mashallah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so mashallah. The, so. It, it's, it will give you a run for your money. Um, That's fine. We'll, uh, see, we'll see how much of a Don is in episode 60 when he's sat there. I'm going to be here for that. <laughs> right. That was an interesting warm-up session, man. How'd you find that? Yeah, it was good. It was good, Hamdi. Yeah? Uh, yeah? You found some, some clever ways to get out of them once, Yeah, man. mashallah. Right. I had, had more time to think about it as well. <laughs> um, look, besides Nightscape Productions, filming, creating content, being involved with Aira... Um, having your own TV shows on various uh, Muslim channels. Uh, you had one on Islam channel? Originally, yeah, I started Ima- off on the Islam I- Iman channel. channel. Iman you channel. Presented. What other channels are like? Uh, Ikra TV. Ikra TV. So, well, like, you've, you, you've had your fair share of involvement on, on in the Dawah scene, from the broadcasting, them kind of things. But today's podcast, I want to focus on perhaps two areas because I introduced you as someone who's involved in the community in a very, very multifaceted way. I know you always say yeah, like a jack of all trades, a jack of all trades, master of none. But I genuinely believe that you're definitely master of many of them. But the very fact that you said you remain committed and involved, or at least interested, is a lot more that can be said than others. Alhamdulillah. Let's begin by some of your thoughts and ideas pertaining to youth reformation, youth development. Ram, explain to me very quickly. You have an idea that's to do with pocket money. Pocket money, yeah. Yeah, and that. To perhaps be something which will instill within the youth not having to turn to crime. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so obviously, especially like in uh, in my community, in the black community, we have um, you know a lot of disenfranchised um, uh, children. Why do you think they're disenfranchised? Poverty. Um, you know, like for example, maybe a lot of them um, from from single parent families and stuff like that, and they struggle to. Um, to get some of the stuff that they want to have, and you know, and they have every right and you know, deserve to have. So what tends to happen is when, when a child grows up um, not having but seeing others have, um, then unfortunately there are many occasions where they'll try to find a shortcut. Shortcut being crime. Being crime. So the little initiative that I have, and these are, you know, these are kind of like very, um, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of ideas that which, you know, I put the idea out and if I can't deliver it myself, then maybe somebody else will deliver it. So with the pocket money, what that's designed to do is it, it instills in the child from a very young age that they will work um, general things around the home. And, you know, the money would come from either a charity mm-hmm. or if, if we were fortunate enough, it would come from a government um, funding. <laughs> Good uh, luck. <laughs> yeah. So, so what would happen is um, they, they may do some certain chores or something. And, you know, from a very young age, they would learn, that, OK, look, this money is yours. It's like your, um, your rewards for doing that work. Mm. And I've seen firsthand what happens where you start to see a child where they don't spend all the time and they actually learn to save what they have. Mm. So even with my own children, for example, like you know, my my youngest son, he has trainers that cost a lot more than mine, mm. right? And um, you know, and he they know how to save, they know how to work for what they can get, um, and because of this, I've I've seen that it has a lot of potential. So with a pocket money scheme, essentially, what would happen is then as they when they reach a certain age. They're thinking about work because that's what that's all they're used to. Um, so they'll, they'll, they'll think about, okay, look, I want to get a job and I want to start continue to save up. Even if it's like a little Saturday job, they'll start saving up and they'll buy. What, and so it means that if someone comes to them and says, look, here's a quick means to get in some money. Mm. Here's a hundred pound. Just go and do this, drop this off for me. Mm. They'll be like, look, I can, you know, I'll just work a little bit and I can get that same thing. And um, it really does help to ground them. So this is my belief. I, and, and I think it's a, Fantastic idea in principle. Has flaws, I'm sure it has no, flaws. No, no, but I'm about to just yeah. present two things to you. Yeah. I remember my uh my uncle, my mum's brother, yeah, uh Emad Mama, love to you. <laughs> um I remember when he said to me, Look, um, pray your salah, uh, 
uh, pray in the masjid in Jama'ah and I'll give you a fiver for each salah that you go and pray in the masjid. Mm -hmm. Now, you know what men are doing now. Now, like there were times where I've gone and said to him, yeah, I've prayed, I'm not prayed. Uh, I started going just for the fiver. Yeah. And not because necessarily because it was an act of ibadah. It had to be done for a, a boy or ch children beyond the age of puberty. Yeah. It literally became, I was praying for that five pounds. Yeah. Right. And that didn't last. The idea was noble. Um, and it worked And then I just got I was like nah mm. I, I can't I, I, I don't want to pray For the fiver anymore right? yeah. And I actually said I want a tenner now You want yeah. a tenner now <laughs> Yes Do you understand So um, My only two concerns with, with such a thing Would be Would it not be the case That Where we should be Perhaps instilling Amongst the youth Our own children Of just doing chores For the sake of being responsible As opposed to It being driven Or at least Always being a financial incentive What happens when that Financial incentive Is not there so, so first of all, yeah, so it definitely wouldn't be um, connected to Ibadah. Mm. No chance, right? That wouldn't happen. Um, that'd be crazy because then you're like, you know, obviously I can imagine enough children that would be actually standing there in front of their parents, pretending that they're praying. <laughs> <laughs> and all they're thinking about is, well, I'm getting a fiver for this, <laughs> right? You know, so no, it wouldn't be attached to Ibadah. But, um, and also you're right, certain chores, there's a certain uh, um, level of responsibility that a child should also have. But there will be a certain thing that's attached to it. Um, it would be something which may be a little bit different. So it's not about washing up the dishes. It's not about doing this. It would be something where, as I said, the idea may not be completely coherent um, to start off with. Give me one kind of chore or task that they'd have to do that will will, will have that incentive there. Um, yeah, so I don't know. It could be attached to, for example... Homework? Tidying room? Not so much tidying the room. Maybe an aspect of the, of, of, of the house, for example... Um, Maybe not tied in. Maybe not tied in your own room. Maybe like something with a bathroom or okay, something cool. like that. Okay, so, so bathroom or kitchen yeah, or toilet or something and, and like that. An extra, yeah, okay, cool. Something like that. Polish the toilet seat or something like that. Fair where enough. and then obviously then the that, money, that the money that comes in, yeah, it comes in uh, in that child's name. Okay, so it's not like the parent says like you know f you know this is out of their purse. Yeah, it'll come in. Maybe it'll go into their bank account. Okay, or something like that, and they know it's there. You know, come the weekend, they sort of say, look, this is what you've earned. Do you want to go shopping, mm. you know, buy a new toy or whatever? Mm. And and they love it. Children absolutely love that. Um, have you have you tried incorporating a similar system with your own children? Um, yeah, I've, I mean, I've done certain things with my children, for example, from a young age. If I were going to go out, you may remember once um, the um, the launch of Rohan's book. Yeah, Roshan's book, yeah. Roshan, yeah. I thought I said that's, that's what I know. No, no, no. Ro Rohan, Roshan. Roshan. <laughs> Ro I don't know where Rohan come from. But, no, no, but um, Rohan is also a common uh, South Asian Persian Okay, Persian. but I know Roshan, so I should yeah, have got go it. Anyway, but um, the launch of his book, I don't know if you remember, I had Your my boy, son. Yeah, yeah, boy was with you. Yeah, so he earned quite well that day. He yeah? was just manning my second camera. That was Nadim, wasn't it? No, that was Fahim. Fahim came. Yeah, that was for him on okay. that day. And he 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 done quite well on that day. He did, and I and I pay a little bit more as well because I want him to understand. Look, this is just do some work. He's standing there for a few hours, mm. but you know, as a result of it, you're going to earn some money. Mm. Um, so you know, there's certain things like that. So a father could take his son out to work, um, you know, on a Saturday or something like that. It doesn't matter how young they are, mm. right? They can take him out. Just do this. Take this out of the car, right? You know, go to the car and pick up this stuff for me, and that's it. Now you've earned a little bit of money. So they understand the value of it. So yes, it absolutely does work, 100%. But to roll it out on a larger scale, I mean, that's something which I think would have a lot of benefit. Well, without bursting your bubble, we mm. can definitely rule out the current Tory government. Because yeah, if unfortunately. Because uh, I'll be honest with you, my brother, it, you know, given the fact that they, they're cutting money back from uh, youth clubs and youth services, I would even go as far as to say with the current administration and even successive administrations prior to them, is that it works in their favour for black youth or, or youth of immigrant descent, but specifically black youth, not to have those opportunities. Yeah. For them to remain in a particular socio socioeconomic situation because it perpetuates a system of, uh, you know, criminalising, isolating and so forth. Do you understand? I, I wouldn't disagree with that yeah, at yeah. all. So, I mean, but the idea is fantastic, but and when, and when we spoke about it off camera, the first thing I thought was, who would fund this? So I, I think, um, I remember in the UK, there was a charity um, and it was run by this uh, woman. I forgot what her name was. And it kind of reminded me of pocket money because it was like a youth-based thing. And I can't remember if there was some kind of controversy with her in the end. I wish I remember what her name was. 
Um, but I liked the feel of, um, you know, that the dynamics of that particular charity where she was looking after the youth. Um, so I think it could work very well as a charity. Do you remember the EMA system? EMA. EMA system was basically when I was in school, when I was in uh, year 12, 13, doing my A level, mm. you'd get £30 a week. Uh, for £30 a week, you'd have to come to all your classes, be punctual. It's brilliant. Uh, and you get £30 a week. And at the end of every term, yeah. you'd get a £120 bonus. That never existed in London. Yeah. Uh, so. Of course it did. It was nationwide under the Labour. Yeah. What year was that then? Uh, so if I was in so 2004, 2005, 2006, mm. uh, it should be £30 a week and you sh- and you'd get a bonus at the end of half term subject to your punctuality uh, and so forth. I like it. Uh, and and, and I, I think that was a fantastic initiative. Uh, even though I know certain man them use that to reload on, on their on their gear and stuff yeah. and shot in school. But the yeah, point yeah, is, yeah. generally speaking, yeah. it worked. Yeah, <laughs> It worked. It was It was a good incentive. Um, staying on that theme of EMA youth development, yeah. I know you had another idea about um, like a school of excellence. Yeah, yeah. What was yeah. the actual name of it? Excellence Academy. Excellence Academy. Yeah. Tell us a bit about that. So, as you know, I mean, uh, we had a discussion the last time about um, you know we, we use a terminology, or well, I use a terminology, um, which was like black on black killing, right? Which um, you know, uh, from a uh, objective like you know view, it sort of uh, comes across in a certain way. Um, for ourselves, we look at it as like you know, there's a the, the, the deaths that occur in my community, which some which creates a lot of concern, and we want to do something to address it. Mm. So, the idea that I have with this Excellence Academy is where we would have these centres, and these centres would basically uh, be almost like a they'd, be, they'd, they'd offer scholarships. So we'd have the youth that would come in, uh, male, female, and when they the minute they walk into this academy, um, they would would instill something in them where like an honor mm. uh for example there'll be a uniform that they'd wear it could be like a really nice track suit with a nice motif on there uh and then what would happen is like there would be a program throughout the day they'd have motivational talks they'd have um you know we'd have celebrities that would be invited to come in and deliver workshops the likes of um i mentioned like idris elba before course, yeah and, I, 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 and I, think that, I think idris elba won't be the first time he gets mentioned in this podcast but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right um so someone like him would come in we do a workshop, not necessarily around acting because he's got other skills, right? Um, so it wouldn't just be a case of coming in and having a chat. There'd be a workshop for the day. Uh, what about the, the day-to-day teaching of it? Day-to-day teaching would be like, again, it would be um, qualified coaches. Uh, and again, it would be motivational. Uh, and it, the, the main thing would be about instilling something within those children to say, like, you are, you know, you have great value. There's a lot you can do in, in, in society. Mm. Um, we'd, we'd kind of give them the skills. We'd give them the resources, there'd be workshops where they'd learn trades and the mm. trades would be something which would be a standard, mm. whether it be like a mechanical course or whatever, hands-on, but that won't be the, their main thing. That would just be something that they can do. Again, with my children, you know, my, my oldest has um, uh, a first degree in um, um, business information system, mashallah. Um, but yet still, you can give him a hammer and, and, and you know, screwdriver, build bits and whatever, and he could produce something for you. So that's a given as well. It has to be done. So I'm I'm envisaging that you'd have this um these excellent centers that would offer all these things for the the youth. So when they come out, they've got a really good head start. They've got a scholarship. They've got the skills. Um, and also it applies to we'd also have like residential uh, academies as well. So for example, it, it would be an alternative to someone who's a young offender. So I was just about to get to that. Is yeah. will there be a space for those who have either come out of youth offender, or or these are individuals who have been permanently expelled from conventional state schools yeah absolutely absolutely and would, they, would, would they mix with the they would absolutely not mix why under any circumstances because so, we want to we want to try and um you know be as safe as possible right and and you don't want it to, to create an environment where someone could be influenced um uh you know ne- negatively so we want to do the best that we can to like keep them together in terms of okay those who um you know maybe need in correction then they may stay <laughs> stay together um, but they'd also, again, they'd be split as much as possible. So there are also, the, well, there would also be correctional um, academies as well. So it could be like someone could be, uh, they could get that as an option, um, an alternative to going to prison. Uh, and it would be completely different. But the main goal would be to, you know, just to get them to come out and to want to, you know, feel the need to offer more in society. Do you, do you feel that, do you feel that whether it be black or people of colour, South yeah. Asia, whatever it may be, do you feel that they're not getting that in state schools? 
No, it's not enough to have in, in a state school. I mean, they can only do so much, mm. first of all. Um, and we know that, for example, look, in the past, in, in the black community, back in the, um, the, the 80s and 90s, we used to see there was a, lot, a, a big emergence of um, like little youth centres that used to try and do things like little Saturday schools for the yeah, children. Yeah, yeah. Um, I myself also used to have a Saturday school. I used to teach um, um, children there as well, not just black children. Um, Are you teaching them Wing Chun? No, no, we used to teach curriculum stuff. I used to okay. teach um, English uh, just for young children. Um, I don't want to mention his name, but there's mashallah. a very well-known person, even from Ayera, Masha, that used to come to my school when he was young. Mashallah. Um, and um, they do really well because like, we saw as well within the kids that, like, Mashallah, and when they used to be together on a Saturday and, like, you know, that environment, it was so good vibes. amazing. Yeah, it was really, really good. Uh, and some of them went on to do really good things as well, Mashallah. Um, so... But then they all sort of fizzled out. But with an excellence academy, it's like we're pumping money into this. We're making sure they're getting the best. And, you know, obviously when they are in that sort of environment where they are um, working together, they're achieving together, mm. then they come out and they also help each other. And maybe they may not all come out with a scholarship and be successful, but those who would, or those who do, they may be able to provide work for the others. You understand so it could work really really well how long has this been going through your mind how long have you been thinking about this stuff excellence academy um for possibly two years pocket money about the same okay yeah is there anything specific that triggered it or, or sparked th- yeah i mean obviously um when i wrote the uh the, the document for um uh it's called um youth reform by way of excellence academy or something like that that was at a time where Two years ago, we were into the first week of that year, and um, the the knife crime at that time was Basically, so it pe- high. It, it peaked in two thousand and nineteen, I think. Two thousand and nineteen, yeah, yeah, that's when it was, yeah. yeah. And it was incredible, and it was like, wow, subhanallah. So then I thought, okay, I need to think of something that, um, you know, that might work. Yeah. And we know that, for example, even if it were like kind of um, you know a small number, yeah. it wouldn't matter because a small number it, it it kind of it can produce a lot, you know, in the end. It'll have so a ripple, basically, say it'll have a ripple effect. Have a ripple effect, yeah. Look, and also, look, just to say as well, like the buildings as well for the Excellence Academy, it couldn't, it can't be just some like old um, community center or old community center. It's got to look the part as an Excellence Academy. And some of these buildings, we won't talk about it now, but you know, um, we can get these from properties in the UK that are sitting stagnant for years, um, which has been clogged up by these overseas um, developers, overseas owners. Um, so there's a lot of properties available that we can use for these centres. That's cool. We can just use the empty churches as well. Well, I mean, whatever. I, I wouldn't use a church anyway. I, it's got to be like the building has to have a, certain, okay. have a certain look about it, yeah. Um, yeah. Look, before we move on to your next area of expertise or, or, or the next area which you're involved with, I, you know the funding element of it? Yeah. yeah. You know the idea I'm with you? Excellence uh, Academy, yeah. yeah. Both. The pocket money and the excellence academy. I think both ideas are fantastic, mm. but money makes the world go around. Yeah, and, and fundamentally, the reason why there is a level of uh, th- there's a huge financial disparity between black communities in the UK, generally speaking, in comparison to their white Caucasian counterparts or even their South Asian ca- counterparts, mm-hmm. is that there is a lack of money and and and, and investment in these kind of uh, services, yeah. and these kind of ideas, and these kind of initiatives. And I'm telling you now, it's not going to happen no. from, from the current government, right? No, 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 no um, definitely not. Maybe the closest we could have come to someone who may have even entertained such an idea would have been Corbyn. Yeah. That didn't happen, yeah. right? Uh, people were more worried about Brexit and immigrants, yeah? Uh, so, how do, does in your thinking, your vision get to a block, a uh, dead end, when you start thinking about that this stuff's going to require money? No, it doesn't. I mean, look... In my um, original document, um, I estimated about fifteen million um, to sort of um, to have. Uh, How many centres? Three. Like, three centres. Uh, the scholar scholarship one, residential, and the correctional one. Cool. Right. Um, and that's achievable. Fifteen million is very achievable. But as you mentioned, with the government, right? I mean, look, we just wait. If this government's not going to do it, there will be a government that will do it. But the idea has to be out there. And um, as I mentioned before, you know, I, I try to make it as coherent as possible as an idea, right? Um, I may never be the one who could deliver something like that, 
But somebody will. And I respect you for that. Your position has always been, as long as I've known you, is that I, I'll have an idea. Yeah. If someone can roll it out and do it better than me, yeah. if, then Bismillah, do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'll step out of the way and let someone do it. Because, I mean... Would you encourage black and people of colour slash Muslim entrepreneurs and philanthropists to perhaps consider something like this? Yeah, 100%, totally. Because that's the only... Totally. That's Because that's the only place where I can see something like this could be flourishing. Yeah. If there was a group or network of black philanthropists, successful entrepreneurs, or those who come from an immigrant descent, and mm. then they start investing money into this. But that requires obviously a, a level of uh, strategic thinking. Uh, yeah, 100%. I mean, but it's, it, it's very um, achievable. Even just one, uh, producing you know, every year, maybe like five or ten sort of uh, you know, scholarships. Um you know, or diplomas, whatever, it's, 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 it's very easily doable. But there's another angle that I have as well, which I know we won't discuss it so much now, but, you know, um, uh, just recently I've, I've written a couple of um, screenplays, like feature-length films, um, and what I've done is within my, within my films, and if they ever get rolled out as well, um, I, I make a point of deliberately just mentioning these things as if they are already existing. Okay. So, oh, are you talking about hypothetically, like if it was the situation where these things existed? Well, in my films, they yeah. exist. Okay, wicked. Yeah, so in, in both my films, they exist. They, they are already there. They're sort of like, you know, so it's something, for example, my protagonist is someone that went to an excellence academy, uh, and as a result of it, then they, that's what makes them on their journey, for example. So um, that's what it is. Start the conversation, and somebody will come along and just sort of say, I know exactly how to make that work. Sure, like, sure. Plan. Like, um, moving on to. The next area which you've kind of been involved in, and that's the Muslim matchmaking scene. Yeah. Right. And I know that you were generally involved in it from quite early on, way before kind of the emergence of uh, matrimonial sites, matrimonial apps. Um, how did it start? How did it start? Well, yeah. As with probably many people, it started off with someone coming to me and saying, "Like, um, can you can you help to find someone for my?" my daughter or my, you know, whatever. And uh, then somebody else would come along, oh, while you're at it, yeah. help us out as well. So yeah. then um, that's kind of how it started. And I kind of, a little list started to, um, you know, got collected. And then that's kind of put me on, that's what put me on the journey, really. And and how were you dealing with uh, all the queries and all the individuals that were seeking spouses? How did you collate? How did you document? How, how, what was the system that was used? So, yeah, back then we didn't have any... Uh, like I was attached to a masjid, I was a secretary in a masjid at the time, and what happened is they had a website, so I just literally just took a page from that website, and I just started to put the, the marriage profiles up on that site, so we'd have like B, B1 down to B20 for brothers, and yeah. S1 down to S20 or 30 for sisters, uh, and it was literally like very much kind of like manual input in of all the, the information, subhanAllah. Did the brothers outnumber the sisters? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally, yeah. Totally did, yeah. Uh, and how many success stories? Uh, Unfortunately, I I could never monetary. tell you as many of the success stories that they, that there were. Uh, maybe I wouldn't call it selfish. I'm not going to use that word, not selfish. But maybe what would happen is I'd find out later on mm. that maybe that person got married. But one of my greatest success stories ever was during the Ayera um, event, which is a uh, uh, seeds of change. Seeds of change for the, the first Muslim Women's Conference. Yes. Yeah. So we were working at, at that conference and I was on my way downstairs to set up and there was a brother that called me over. Uh, brother Jamal, and I was thinking, I don't know who this person is. Mm. And he sort of like, he called me over, I went over to him and then he started introducing me to his children. He had some young children, two or three of them. And I'm thinking like, oh, mashallah, but why did his brother tell me this? And he said to me, um, I'm B25 or something like that. And he goes, I married um, S whatever. And these are our children. And I thought that that was amazing. I mean, I, that was in my mind for the rest of that day, subhanAllah. So B sat in, met S sat in, yeah, got married, got married, and then you saw him at a conference and yeah. the, the children were there. Yeah, subhanAllah. That Mel was like, amazing. No, I accept it from you. I bro. mean, I mean. But but we know that the stories aren't all hunky-dory. No. Right? And not that I've specifically brought you here to talk about the more kind of spicier stuff, mm. but no doubt you must have had some challenges uh, in the matchmaking scene, especially very early on. Uh, what are some of the obstacles and problems that you experienced in the matchmaking scene mm-hmm. in terms of seriousness, commitment? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you have a lot of, um, I don't know, like these shopping lists. And, you know, they have a brother, for example, and 
I, I guess it happened with the brothers more than with the sisters. You know, they have this like long shopping list of like, um, yeah, she's got to be this, this age, she's got to look like this, this nationality, blah, 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 whatever. And, and then it'll be like, okay, look, in the beginning, I used to try. And even on that, on that marital website, it would also have, for example, like, um, bro, I am so-and-so, I'm living um, a, a, deep, a village deep in Pakistan. Yeah. I want to marry sister from the UK. All oh, right. Help me, so whatever. So in the end, I had to like put a stop on that and to say no one from international. This is like you know. So it's a UK thing, yeah. UK only, yeah. Um, but the shopping list was the worst thing. So, so, so I'm assuming brothers would come to you with a full list of ideals. Yeah. Height, ethnicity, skin yeah. color, body yeah. shape. No children. No children. All, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So, why was that a problem for you? Because because there. I started to find there were more and more like that coming along. So rather than just getting the job done, it was like, okay, look, you know, I'd introduce them and there'd be a sister, for example, that I'd think it's a beautiful match. Mm. It's this wonderful match. And it's like, no, she's one year too older. All right. And, and so much, take it so seriously, she's one year too old, mm. right? She's still younger than me, but she's one year too old. Oh, she's going to have problems with children. She's just like, how do you know? How common was that? It was too common. It was too common. It happened so many times. And uh, until I, ca- I sort, of, sort of got harder with these brothers and just said, oh, well, I can't help you. Uh, with uh, with some of these brothers and their preferences, mm. wasn't it a case where some of the preferences were reasonable uh, and some were unreasonable? Yeah, there were more... Um, so, 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 tell, so tell me about... So what is an unreasonable preference? An unreasonable preference... Would be, for example, um, this sister, if she or an unreasonable objection. What's un- what, what? What would you consider as unreasonable? Like, so I mentioned age. Like, say, for example, there's a brother who might be in his thirties, right? And he considers like twenty five to be too old okay. for a sister. You know, oh, she's getting a bit older at that age. And he's 30. And he's in his 30s. He's in his 30s. What's he looking for? Early 20s? Early 20s. Oh, right. okay. And so, you know, for example, in the beginning, I'd be trying to help. And I'd say, okay, there's a sister, she's like 25 or she's 26. Did you ever say to the bro- these brothers that has it ever occurred to you that someone in their early 20s may not want to marry someone in their early 30s? Uh, many times. <laughs> many times. But, I mean, to be fair, there were a lot of sisters who didn't mind brothers in that age group. Okay, humble. Yeah, it just didn't work so well, vice versa, but... You know, obviously, the, the also didn't mind. So that's why I didn't mind trying. But after a while, I'm thinking, like, how are you saying that this is too old? How is she too old? Do you know what I mean? And, and then like, there'd be a sort of, a, you know, a, a, they'd meet. And I, I can understand. If someone says, okay, she's not, um, you know, she's not exactly what I'm looking for. That she's not as pleasing to my eye as I'd, I would have liked. Mm. That's fine. I can't, I can't touch something like that. But if it's sort of like, you know, she's actually really nice and, well, but... I'll just maybe see like what might come afterwards, and okay. then after that, it'd be like, "Wow, well, that's going, bro! You're going too far now. You're I going too far now, man." So, what are, you, what are you looking for? Have you ever sat in on any of these meetings? Yeah, 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 I have done. And, and 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 have you seen some of these unreasonable objections come across in a man's uh, body language and stuff? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, from the first like five minutes that this is a. It's not happening. It's not happening. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, from the first five minutes. So, so obviously, obviously, you said uh, disproportionately, most the dramas or or kind of uh, obstacles and objections mm. were mainly from brothers. In that regard, but I saw some some cases with the sisters as well. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Definitely. Uh. You know, th- there was one case, Subhanallah, where a brother came all the way from France. Oh, wow. In one day, this was like this was quite painful for me actually, <laughs> right? This was quite painful for me because the brother made some efforts, right? Well, that's a that's a that's a big journey, bro. All the way from France, he doesn't know anyone in the UK. He wasn't going to stay with anyone. He's going to go back on the same day, right? He came all the way from France, and the minute he walked into that coffee shop, I took one look at the sister's face and I thought, oh, Subhanallah, man, she, she went interested. She was not interested. But did she not see his photo or anything beforehand? I don't remember. Good Lord. I, I, hope, she, I hope she saw was, him before but there was, that. There was a thing, right? There's a question, right? There's a question. What do you think of this question? Does a sister have a right to ask for a brother's picture if she doesn't want to give him her picture? 
I think brothers have more right to see a sister's uh, photo than a sister seeing a brother's photo. You do? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Also. I, uh, because uh, generally speaking with men folk, um, you kind of see what you get aesthetically, um, especially in the age of uh, filters, uh, makeup, and the horrendous level of deception with that comes with makeup, I think. And obviously with hijab as well, because a hijab covers a woman's ear, it covers her under her chin, covers many things. So I think a man has more right and more legitimate reason for wanting to see a woman than her seeing a man. And I'd think brothers shouldn't, I'd, I wouldn't understand why brothers would hesitate to share their photos. Are you saying that you've had where brothers don't want to give their photos up? No, I've I, I've seen cases, um, and it happened a lot, where, for example, a sister would say, I'm not giving them a picture, but I want to see your picture. So when that used to happen, I'd sort of say, I, I can ask, but it's a bit of an uncomfortable thing to ask for, because yeah. maybe it's better to just, if you don't want to show your picture, then just meet. Yeah. And that did happen a few times. Right? I'd, I'd say even the meeting could be problematic, because... You know, if 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 you're meeting a, a brother or a sister who generally are fantastic human beings, very yeah. good Muslims, they're serious and, and committed to wanting to get married, mm. but just that initial spark of attraction's not there, and it's quite the opposite. You've wasted a lot of people's time there. Do you understand? Yeah. Um, I find that I understand why sisters don't want to give up their photos first. Um, I appreciate that there's a level of wanting to get to know each other a bit more mm. because I think with sisters. There's a lot more things that they will look at in a man besides the aesthetics, mm. the outward. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas with the mandem and the brothers, um, that's kind of yeah, yeah, that's that's high in the yeah, priority the primary, list. Yeah. yeah. So I believe men have. I think it's important that everyone should see each other's photos. Everyone should see each other's photos. Yeah. I mean, pictures pictures don't tell all anyway. Like you mentioned, for example, um, uh, filters. Right, you get that a lot more now. But back then, you you know, there's a different type of filter, like the efforts that a person makes, they put in their photograph. And, you know, we can see how different a woman would look when she's not um, wearing makeup, for example. Even sometimes the way she might wear her hijab as well. Of course. Um, there's a lot of those features that um, would make a person look completely different. Mm. So it is all in the meeting, mm. right? It is all in the meeting. But on this instance with that brother that came from France and, um, you know, he walked into the shop and I kind of knew straight away that... It, and I felt very uncomfortable immediately. How long did that meeting last? Not even long, bro. It didn't even last like 20 minutes. Oh, my God. Who paid the bill? He did. Um, no, I paid that bill. All right. I, I paid that's that the bill. least you could do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the least you could do. I mean, it's not my fault. Bro. It's not my fault. I was there to facilitate, <laughs> right? But just the fact that he had, you know, when he he was deflated. Mm. Of course he was, right? bro. It's he was deflated. And I don't, and I think that he did share a picture, but you know, like, as I said, a picture you, you look completely different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, um, I don't, th I don't think there's anything wrong with looking your best self in photos. You're never gonna give a photo where you're looking a bit mingy. You know what I mean? No. You're gonna give a photo where you dress nice and you look nice. Mm. But I think, especially in this year, I'm not talking about the time when you were involved in matchmaking. But I think, in light of what's happening now, what's normal now. You know, there's, just, there's just there's just way too many things that you need to see that person in real life. Also, you have to see them in real life. Yeah, right? I, or at least see photos which are the most closest to yeah. the, the the real representation of of, yeah. of a woman, yeah. right? Uh, so I think that's important. Yeah. On that tip, on that tip, have you ever dealt with polygynous uh, um, inquiries uh, where brothers are seeking? Uh, a second wife or a co-wife or if a sister is actively seeking to be a co have you ever dealt with those yeah i have done yeah yeah, yeah. definitely um any success stories there yes um even to this day um there have been some uh, some good success stories yeah mashallah and even for example marriages that didn't work out they didn't work out because it was it wasn't because of the polygamous nature of the marriage or why it didn't work out it was like genuine sort of differences between the husband and wife where they sort of moved on uh, because I never at any time entertained, um, which I forgot to mention that as a caveat, I've never ever entertained just some random brother coming to me and just sort of saying, I want a second wife, mm. uh, can you help me? I mean, I'm not saying I, I, I did try in the very beginning, so I didn't, to say I never did is not true, mm. but, um, you know, I would try, even in my marriage service, actually, there was a brother, mashallah, who from he was the longest person on that on that thing. He's probably still on there now, even though the website <laughs> <laughs> the website's done and dusted, but he's probably still on there now, subhanAllah. But um 
Yeah, he he really tried, man. He really tried, but I knew he wasn't going to get it. He was quite young as well, and his sisters are very afraid of like a young brother coming along saying he want to get married again. So what's but young? Well, what's seen as he young? Was, he was about 25. Oh, raw. Yeah, he's about 25, and, you know, it, it was... Um, I can understand why you know they would want to sort of avoid someone like that. Do you think? Do you think uh, there is an element of brothers liking the idea of a polygynous marriage or having a second or even a third wife uh, to those who actually are committed and serious to wanting one? Do you think there's a lot of brothers who like the idea, flirt with the idea, too many, and when it push comes to shove, it ain't happening. Too many, yeah, too many. I've, 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 I've. There's a lot of brothers, for example. Um, they've done this thing where, um, and I don't really agree with it. Um, they beat their wives up with polygamy. Um, long before they even are anywhere near. Um, uh, what's the word? Ready to actually do it. When you say beat them with polygamy, as in threaten them with it. Not, no. Like you can beat someone by accident. Yeah. Right. And what it is, they have this notion that from the outset, when I first get married. I don't want it to be a problem like one year down the line where when I want to do it, I'm going to have problems. So I'm going to let her know from the beginning that I want to get married again. So that's all you've, so you've already started your first marriage on that note. On that note. So then you start f- all the time. So now you're beating them because you keep reminding them, yeah, yeah, you want to get married again probably because I know if I leave it too long, I don't say nothing. Mm. That's it. I'm going to lose my chance. Mm. Right. So then now, obviously, then they have... Sometimes a bit of confrontation, have a bit of a problem with also, it now. You've instilled an insecurity in them. You've instilled, yeah, exactly. Why so early? Why do you need that now? What's the problem? We're, you know, we've only just got married. You know, that sort of stuff. So then it becomes a problem. When you've heard that and seen that a lot? I've seen, um, yeah, I have seen that. I've That's seen mad, that. Bro. Yeah. yeah. Um, have you seen cases where brothers use polygyny to basically, they, they think it's a solution for the, f- the breakdown of their first marriage? Um, so they see it as okay. The first, the first marriage isn't going great. You know, we're, we're kind of growing apart. Whatever problems they're facing, the solution must be get another one, get another wife. Not, not as a, a solution to help them in their first marriage, but just for them as a solution to sort of say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not really happy here, so maybe I'll be happy somewhere else, and then tolerate here. Okay. Um, but yeah, not, but, uh, but that'd be mashing up the first marriage even more. Then it would do, yeah. Definitely. What's your views on sisters who drive their husbands to wanting another wife? Oh, do you mean like encourage them or drive them because they just drive them insane? No, no. The, the whole encouraging one is, yeah. is, I mean, I don't know how many of those cases you, you've seen where a, a woman actively seeks a co-wife for her. I've husband. got a couple of beautiful stories. Tell us one then. You want a beautiful story? Um, I introduced a brother to a sister, mashallah, and a sister from the beginning so much respect for the sister. Mashallah, just recently she's been back in touch with me again. So uh, I always remind her, I even say to her, I talk about you, right? Anecdotally, of course, yeah. yeah. Um, wonderful sister. She was so facilitating to her husband. She was like, Mashallah, proper queen, yeah. And uh, one day she goes to some event in, in Whitechapel and then she sees this absolutely amazing sister, mm-hmm. right? And she goes, I think my husband would like you. I think you're getting really well with my husband. Right, you know, would you be interested? I, I walk in and she literally, she literally, she um, coordinated, she set it up, yeah. and she, she actually helped facilitating for her husband to get married to this sister. Did Did he get married to her? Got married to her, yeah. Do you know if they're still married? Nope. Okay, they're not married. But just um, okay. So what do you think? What do you think makes that sister stand out? What do you think that makes that sister stand out? To just, the, just, to just the, because of what she did, like I'm not saying it as the, it's an expectation for all no, sisters no, no, to no, do no, that. No, of course not. Yeah, but, course but not. it's just that when you see something like that, you sort of it really makes you kind of sort of think like, well, mashallah, why would you do something like that? Because she, she just wanted to, um, you know, wanted to do so much for her husband, right? Ah, oh, my days. And there's another beautiful. Because that's a well. different level of selflessness. It's a different level of selflessness. Let me tell you something, right, bro? Um, 2014 in Africa, there's a brother that we met, yeah, and um. He had a beautiful wife here. Where in Africa? Uganda. Yeah, but my brother, in West Africa, if you have one wife... But you got to hear this story though, right? But is it not true that in them yeah. kind of countries, Sierra Leone, yeah. Senegal, yeah. Nigeria, yeah. them kind of like West African countries, yeah. you, if you've got one wife, they look at you like, this, you all right there, bro? Yeah. It's good right. that you're interrupting me because I'm wondering now, should I actually tell this story? Because um, I'm just wondering if it is... A <laughs> no, go on, tell me, go on. But um, it's just an amazing thing. All no, it was... No, no, polygynous marriages in West yeah. Africa... 
and in places like Yemen and Somalia and Afghanistan and yeah. them countries, it should be celebrated yeah. because because the women folk and and and, the, and and just the the urf the society is accepting of that. Yeah. So tell me about. I don't know now. Anyway, so no, no, tell me. So anyway, what happened is, so mashallah, the, the brother was getting married again. Yeah, and uh, his his existing wife, she um sort of what happened? She basically kind of said to her like, you know, in their marital sort of like home, and she went to the house as well. And she just brought a jug and she goes like, you know, he, he likes a jug of water or a jug of orange or water at the side of the bed. Mm. And um, and I just thought like, wow, do you know what I mean? That's like, uh, that's really, that's, yeah, that's selfless. That's very admirable. Of course it is. Um, to do something like that, you know, much And he loved, he loved that wife so, so much afterwards. And unfortunately she, um, she lost her life and, you know, he, 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 he spoke about her in such an amazing way. So it's incredible. And I, again, I'm not saying these things as if it's an expectation that we expect this, but when you see something like that, it makes you think, it makes you look at that person, you look into that person and you know, you see what happened, you know, subhanAllah. So, so So let's 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 go into what is more so the norm or, or, or more so what is more common. Yeah. And that is that sadly even the topic of polygynous marriage is one which men and women alike uh, Muslims walk around on eggshells and a minefield. The very fact that you and I are on this podcast talking about it, yeah, um, will trigger uh, a lot of brothers and sisters. I think yeah. sisters more than brothers. Yeah, um, just the very fact that I've seen it with my own eyes. Just the mere discussion mm-hmm. that a Muslim man, by the very virtue of the fact that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said in Surah An Nisa. That you have one wife, have two wife, have three, have four. What your right hand possesses, if you can be just. That was obviously an English paraphrase of that of that verse of the Quran. Allah stipulates within that verse the sh- the caveat, and that is to be just. Mm-hmm. And if you're unable to be just, then one is enough. Yeah. Just that mere utterance, just to know that that is a mainstream, normative, orthodox position amongst the four schools. That a man doesn't even necessarily need a reason to remarry He can just remarry And then there's the whole discussion about informing the wife Seeking her permission Now, I don't know about the other three Sunni schools But I know amongst uh, the Hanafis There's no such things about asking permission of the wife mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. It's just normal to inform her to avoid dramas Because <laughs> how, how are you going to be communicating With a second wife But the first one doesn't know It's going to look like an affair It's, it gonna, is, yeah. it's, it's just a madness yeah. So uh, what I'm saying to you The reality is And I've seen this so much uh, In real life And I definitely see it on, online a lot That as soon as a conversation of polygyny comes up It's automatically met with Muslim men being incapable of being just And being able to handle more than one wife And then that's usually countered by Brothers who then say, well, sisters, your mentality and your mindset isn't that, you're not ready for it. To even understand that the Prophet ﷺ did it. That many of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, they did it. So you guys all being practicing sisters who wear jilbab, niqab, you know, pray your salah, take your deen very seriously. You know, even give da'wah and, and give circles about sahabiyat and so forth. But in reality, you guys are not ready for it. So I always see that to and fro. Which is it? What have you experienced more? Is it a case of brothers are unable to be just? Or is it a case of that sisters, at least in this day and age, and especially in the West, simply don't even want to think about the prospects of such a thing? Yeah, absolutely both are, are apply. Absolutely both. And majority of brothers, um, it goes without saying, are not capable of being just. And, and, and therefore, you know, like, as a stipulation... You know, Allah, I mean, and I'm, I'm not because I'm like doing a tafsir on, on the ayah, right? Mm. But we're understanding that Allah, is, the way he says it, is a way to sort of say, yes, do it, because it's a natural thing. Marry two, three, four, right? What's a natural thing? That, that a man, um, you know, based on our, our understanding, right? Why are you laughing, man? <laughs> I want to hear what it's going to come out of your mouth. <laughs> based on a natural understanding, and, and I think the, most people would... would have the argument Yes there are many many men Who are very monogamous By nature There are many Most men are monogamous By the very virtue Of the, the life that they live in But are you saying that It is a thing within a man That he would desire More than one woman Yeah Okay Yeah 100% So cool. and, and I think like This is this is um, You know Understood So But when Allah says it It's like you Marry two, three, four But if you can't be just Then marry only Literally, one Literally that's what Allah, So Allah put that condition there Yeah You can't be just Have yeah. one 
But, you know, we, we, we need to be careful that we don't just sort of think, oh, yeah, well, because Allah said so, right? And they completely disregard the second part. And that's what people are doing. They're talking about how, yeah, it's my need, it's my this, it's my rights, and it's whatever. I don't have to tell you nothing about it and whatever. But yet still, when you see how these brothers, um, you know, treat their wives very unjustly, mm. and when you see that, and they're not even making an effort, they're not even thinking about it, then what does Allah say? Well, the hadith about how the, the man walking lopsided in the hellfire. Of course. Right, because he's imbalanced, right? No one thinks about that. They just sort of think, oh, yeah, yeah, marry two, three, four, I can do that. But there's, there, are, there, are, there are consequences if you don't do it properly. And and that's what I see. I see very, very many um, um, marriages where, you know, you sort of think, okay, this is this is not a, a, a balanced, a just and balanced um, uh, arrangement. But what, but what would your thoughts then be on those brothers who literally just want another wife because they fear committing zina or that things have been exhausted uh, with the first wife from a kind of uh, creative point of view, from an intimacy point of view, um, that there's nothing wrong per se with the first wife. She's very dutiful. She's a, she's, she's a top woman. Uh, I love her, but I need another woman purely on, the, on on an intimacy level um, and I fear I fear uh, descending into something which is haram or could be haram so I need to remarry is that not in your perspective or have you never think is that would you say that's a valid enough reason or would you say so it's a valid enough reason um, I think um, you know um, maybe there are many sort of uh, aspects of this that I know that I'm not qualified to um, talk about so you know it, it might be based on my opinion more than anything else but likewise my brother yeah likewise. so so I, I think like for example in a situation like that yes of course he this would be this man's right to do that yeah but what about the efforts that he would be making to ensure that his wife is still happy how does he know that she's even happy with him the first wife yeah has he been looking after her has he been looking after her physical needs, mm. right? You know, um, I've had I, I, I've had sisters say things to me about their husbands I can't even repeat. Although it was so funny, it made me laugh, and I was thinking like, "Well, subhanallah." I'm about intimacy and stuff, or a lack. Yeah, of yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, and and uh, it's like um, men should be doing that too. They need to be looking after their wives in that regard, not just sort of thinking like, "Okay, well, you know, whatever." Maybe you haven't communicated properly with, with your wife so you know explore that as well you know what i mean so so explore so explore trying to sort the first marriage out maybe yeah the t look you know there, there might be something that you need to be doing you need to make an effort even for you to be happy you need to make an effort maybe you like to be less selfish um maybe to you know to be obviously more considerate and then then after that when it comes down to it then you know because at the end of the day it's, it's, there's a danger it's a, every it's a given right um, Islamically for a man to just say, okay, look, as you mentioned, I just want to have more um, uh, effects, intimacy. Mm. It's a given right that you can do that, but at the same so, time... So there's, so there's intimacy and there's also that aspect of wanting more children uh, because you want Prophet Sallam to be proud of your numbers as per the very famous hadith that he, he Sallam wants to be proud of our numbers on the Day of Judgment. Yeah. So naturally, if you have more wives, naturally you, the, the prospects of having more children is, is, is more of a reality. But, but so, I, don't, I don't see that as... A common intention. The common intention is usually because the brothers are have intimacy needs, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a common intention. I think there's so many there's so many different intentions, right? There's so many different reasons why people get married. Yeah. You're saying that's a common one for the brothers. I think there's a common one for the brothers, and I. Would you say it's the would you say it's the main one? That they just want another woman. I've had um, even as recent as about a month and a half ago, I had a brother who, um, he's one of those sort of. I'd say genuine people who he, he sees it like, you know, I, I do want to have more than one wife and, um, you know, this is what I want to do within that, those marriages and stuff like that. He's got, he's got it all mapped out. Okay. And he doesn't come across as someone that's like, who just, you know, yeah, I just want to have two women mm. um, in my life in that regard. So you know, you have that, but I think it's a common thing that, you know, maybe, maybe brothers are, are thinking in that way that I just want to, you know, whatever. But again, it's, it's about being just. How common, how common is it? From your experience, your observations, the cases that you've dealt with, uh, even marriages that you've been there as a mediator or so forth, where once a brother has remarried uh, or, or has married another another woman, mm -hmm. that there is 
a level of isolation, disproportionate focus on the new wife, kind of abandoning the first one. Have you seen that? Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, and it does happen because another reason why I've said before, like this is a, this is an example of not being able to be just. Okay. Um, you know, you can't help it. You know, and stuff like that. You know, obviously. Brother might sort of say like I've, I've snuck around to my new wife's home or something like that, and okay. you know, um, you know, it might sound funny at the time, right? You know, because it's 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 innocent. When I say innocent, it's just a little playful little thing that, that they might do, but it's it's you know, Subhanallah. I think there's, I think there's a hadith um, with the Prophet, Prophet and uh, someone who's had knowledge will quote me on this later on but I think there was an occasion where he got married but when he got married he went home to his first wife not to the new wife mm-hmm. um, to, just to show her and to spend that time to help her within that, uh, that transition course. and that situation but you know maybe brothers don't think about that you know they sort of think okay balance and justice means okay I'm gonna I've got the money so I can give her this amount and give her this amount but there's so much more so much more than just money and that yeah, yeah there's so much more to it than just that um, what, what, what's, your, what's your thoughts on um, Literally just in my, my mind went blank uh, yeah. what's, what's your thoughts on Brothers who Have got into religious marriages Right um, And The first wife doesn't know The second wife knows So secret second marriages um, You've experienced those Yeah uh, Recipe for disaster or you've seen them work as well I can't see how it can work. It's a recipe for disaster. Cause it's not sustainable, is it? It's not sustainable. <laughs> um, it, it's it's probably like it's just crazy because like you know the stress wise as well for that person. Do you know what I mean? It's 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 insane. You know, obviously every time he wants to go to his wife, which is his right to go to his new wife, but he's made it that it's not his right. Okay, so, so he's just moving very secretively. Moving secretly, yeah. Um, would you encourage brothers who are serious about polygynous marriage to be to be open and frank with their first yeah, wife? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think so totally. And, and I think that um, if it's something that she's not going to accept, yeah, um, then I think he should maybe spend a bit more time uh, trying to maybe to help her to accept it. Um, if his reasons are good, if his reasons are not good, then it's a, it's a different kettle of fish. He could just say, okay, look, it's my right. I'm going to exercise it. I don't care what happens as a result of it. Mm. Uh, and if you want to, you know, stop me from seeing my children or if you want to, you know, whatever, uh, you want a divorce as a result mm. of it, then so be it. Um, mm. I'm not going to allow you to, you know, to suppress me in this way. Um, but it's a bit of a, obviously it's a bit of a gamble, but so it's better to maybe spend that time. Uh, what would your advice be to, Muslim women, especially in the West, who simply just don't want to entertain this conversation, not about themselves being co wives or, or their husbands uh, potentially having second wives, but just the subject, just the subject itself of mm. polygyny being a, such a sensitive red line that we want to champion all the wives of the Prophet, yes. our mothers, Ummul Mu'mineen, may Allah be pleased with them all. We want to talk about them, we want to praise them, we want to take our sunnah from them, we want to take our religion from them, we want to take our marital etiquettes and rules and regulations from them. Right? But just simply don't want to talk about it and even let it give it any kind of precedence or importance as a solution to potentially some issues that we're having in the community. What would you advise me to be to those sisters who don't even want to really entertain this discussion about it being a legitimate prospect for Muslim men? It, it, it's very difficult to advise um, um, a sister like that because mm. they're very set in their ways and they're very adamant and, you know, they won't hear it. Mm. There are some that will not hear it. Uh, well, we're not talking about them sharing their husband. We're talking about just the conversation itself. Just having that conversation. Just, yeah. just, just, just having that conversation that a man, a Muslim man, having multiple wives or two, three or four, whatever it may be, um, is something that can potentially address certain issues that are growing in society, um, or just that it is the man's right and he can have it, right? Um, but they don't even want to entertain that. Um, what would you advise to those sisters? Because mm. you've given brothers advice, you've told the brothers to take it seriously, be just, try address your first marriage, see if yeah. anything can be fixed. But you see what it is. Like for example, there was an instance with a, a sister who she was very close to rejecting the ayah. 
And um, so I had to advise her that, you know, it's something that whether you like it or not, it's something which is, it's there, you know, mm. you have to accept it. Um, but in terms of a discussion and, you know, not allowing that discussion, it's a difficult one because what would happen is they would have heard so many um, horror stories about how it went wrong uh, that they don't want to entertain it, they don't want to discuss it. But um, maybe, I don't know, maybe they should have that discussion because within that discussion, what they can do is they can put their case forward as to why they think um, it's a bad idea to have it sort of, uh, you know, mm. exercise here mm. in this instance, um, why she would have a problem with it. Because then obviously he can address that. And just Fair say, well, enough. if I were to get married again, not saying that I would, but if I were, this is my reasons why, this is what I would do and all that kind of stuff. But the first question that uh, you know, a, a woman asks naturally is, um, what's wrong with me you know when that com- when that when that subject gets br- um, broached mm. you know and um how a, a man sort of uh, answers that mm. maybe i don't know many times he's he's not going to answer it sincerely before before we move on to uh you know the last topic of today's podcast um why do you think polygynous marriages work in some parts of the muslim world very successfully to the extent where it's practically normalized to I would say the majority of the Muslim world. So we've already mentioned West Africa. You know, mashallah. You know, West African countries are holding it down when it comes to religious marriages uh, in terms of something which is not seen as abnormal in the slightest. It's very much normal in Afghanistan, uh, Yemen, Somalia, uh, some of the Khaliji countries. Uh, why does it work there, but doesn't work in places, let's say, like Turkey, North Africa? Southeast Asia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, Malaysia, Indonesia, and these kind of countries. Why do you think it works in those countries? And oh, I don't know. I, you meant those other examples, those countries you mentioned, they made it a bit tougher for me to respond because I was going to say, for example, like in the West mm. uh, and in uh, West Africa, um, I was going to say, for example, that it's um, respect and societal culture, like here, you know, how people, what we see, what we're exposed to on the TV. <laughs> And how we kind of, um, you know, we the, the, the visuals that we are given and stuff like that. And in that way, we, we, do, we, we don't think long term. Mm. Uh, but when it comes to some of the other countries that you mentioned, like that is a bit of a tough one because... Uh, because in Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, bro, in yeah. Southeast Asia, uh, and even if you want to check in Indonesia there, where the vast majority of the global ummah is, is uh, polygynous marriage is seen as something that's generally done uh, with a guilty conscience. Uh, it's... Sometimes it's many times it's done secretively. Yeah. Sometimes it's as a result of the failure or breakdown of the first marriage, but a reluctance of the man to even divorce his first wife. But it just as a way, like I'm done with the first wife, I'm gonna mm. now go do this, and it's seen as something that's uh, negative. Mm. Um, it becomes a case of gossip in the community and within the family, but that's that. That's not really the case. Mm. Uh, uh, in I, I I couldn't actually. Um, I don't think I've got enough experience to kind of uh, to try to explain those dynamics because mm. like with those other countries that you mentioned for example why should it be a problem it shouldn't be okay mm. i think it comes from so, so i mean i've got my own kind of theory i think that with west african uh, countries um yemen somalia i was going to ask you are, are women more in charge in those other countries uh, that you mentioned? um they they i don't know i mean but but there they, they, they definitely is a tribal element to it that some of these countries that i mentioned there is a a a a very centered focus on tribal uh, culture, tribal values, mm. right? Um, I do believe that many West African women uh, are quite confident in not feeling insecure in sharing their husbands. I, I, I think that. And I think in Southeast Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, because pre Islam, it was Hinduism, and Hinduism doesn't have a concept of multiple wives. In fact, they have a, the opposite concept, which is. If you di- if your husband dies, you never remarry. You shave your head off, and get and, and and kind of remain like that for the remainder of your life. So I think that has that cultural element is something that's very Option. apparent. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I just asked you, uh, are women more in charge in in that? Because it just um, uh, you know, some some examples that brothers had given, you know, where you know the the wife. Um, you know, and they make it in a joke sort of sense as mm. well that you know she she calls the shots. Mm. You know, so. But we know that there was a, there was a difference in between Makkah women and Madani women. 
We know that when uh, some of the companions they went to the Prophet and and, and and kind of complained and said, "Look, the women of Medina are very forthright, are very assertive, uh, you know, and and they and they're influencing our women, who are kind of seen as not quietest but more kind of passive and 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 and, and honourably submissive and these kind of things." We know that even between Makkah and Medina women at the time of the Prophet there was the a difference. difference. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think I mean there's no statistical data. To look at trends and, and why it's successful and normal in some societies And why it isn't in others in the Muslim world But it is an interesting one Because even outside of the West There's difference in the Muslim world Where it's normally and it's practiced widely And where it's kind of seen as a negative thing yeah, yeah. Bring the podcast to a close And staying on the topic of marriage mm-hmm. I know you have another interesting theory And it's about uh, uh, spousal or marital attraction uh, and hormonal changes uh, Specifically to do with When a woman gives birth Or after she gives birth uh, And the kind of changes that she experiences Whether it's emotional, hormonal, physical uh, And her husband's uh, engagement Or lack of it to that And when it's flip-sided When a woman is feeding her husband and etc And he puts on a bit of size Puts on a bit of pounds And, and has moved away from the ideal that she fell for or the ideal that she had that there's a disparity in their attraction am i if i got it kind of correct kind of yeah it's, it's it's an interesting um um thing which it's like it's as you mentioned theory observation um you know uh, okay, speculation uh, all this kind of stuff but uh, okay well, hold on yeah let me let me just put it down in simpleton terms then uh, based on the off-camera conversations that we've yeah. had um a sister has an ideal yeah. uh, physique or something, a man that she finds attractive. She gets that man, mm. right? He's tall, he's broad, he whatever, he's short, he's hench, or he's slim, he's athletic, whatever it may be. Whatever it may be. Um, she feeds her husband. Uh, according to you, um, a woman's manifestation of her love for her husband is that she feeds him. We've seen this. Yeah. We know this oh. it happens. And so he... Now puts on some pounds yep. uh, his, that, that physique which she initially saw as an ideal She liked Changes He puts on a bit of a pound Gets a bit of a dad pod yep. Gets a few handles and all that She loves him more Because she sees it as That is my The fruits of my love Yeah mm. uh, But when the sister gives birth to children uh, And her she experiences some outwardly changes that the brother become or the the husband become disinterested or or the aesthetic pleasure in seeing her decreases. Is that more or less what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, pretty much so. Like so, so, so as you mentioned, for example, when when as the husband changes, uh, he metamorphosizes, he becomes big, as you mentioned, his stomach yeah. and whatever. Um, her ideal may not change. She may still like the the tall, dark, handsome, or whatever type of person with a, with that physique, but her love for her husband adapts in the way that she still loves him. She's still attracted to him, um, and she will be with him for so many, you know, for forever mm. if need be, right? Um, but whereas on the other side, as you mentioned, with with, with the with the husband, like obviously they have children together, um, and. As she changes, I mean, you have many, many women, for example, don't get me wrong, who after giving birth, they will go back to how they were before. Um, but there are others who, you know, they, they don't. And it's just the way things are sometimes. Mm. Many people might argue, right, there are brothers um, we both know who have very frank conversations. And, you know, mashallah, you used to, you, you used to have this discussion with them as well as mm. a podcast. It'd be brilliant. You just direct. The sisters, you know you can do this. You know you can, you know, why, whatever, why are you not doing that, Right. For as example, in, as in, why aren't you going back to the shape? Why that you aren't were? you making an effort to go back to the shape you were before? Yeah. Right, it's a very frank conversation, right? Mm. Um, but sometimes it can't happen. But sometimes it won't happen. Sometimes mm. there's struggle. Um, but the man's ideal doesn't change, so he doesn't adapt in the same way that his wife adapts. Okay, right. So she still may have an ideal, but she still is very much attracted to her husband. Right? Is but, it is it an adaption or is it a compromise, bro? Well, on the man's side or the woman's side? Both sides. On her side, it's not a compromise. I think what? it's like because, um, you know, she, the love that she experiences, uh, she expresses, um, maybe she doesn't focus as much on the physical than that, what he does, right? So maybe that's the reason why. Mm. But you, you've seen it on many programs. Like women, they still sit together. I'm not talking about the Muslim. I'm just saying you have that and they say, oh, yeah, oh, this guy, he's this. this. Mm. Even though they're married, they still yeah. do that, yeah. right? But they don't, like, they're not disgusted with their husbands, 
unless he's not being fed by her and he yeah, just like gets her. pizzas every day yeah, and becomes yeah, yeah. a fat slob and yeah, sitting yeah. there. That's different, but you know, that, that's a different thing altogether. But with a man, his ideal doesn't change. If he's always liked a certain um, shape or size of a woman, then mm. uh, after that, you know, he may his eyes may be more inclined to sort of maybe to wonder, mm. um, you know, and, 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 and that there is where the discussion lies. Like, you know, what do we do? Is there something that we can do within that to help a marriage to be to stay fresh, to stay, um, you know, vibrant and so on? So, so, so let, let's ex- let's explore some of that then. So first and foremost, do you think it's unreasonable mm. For a man A Muslim man To have That ideal That he doesn't want to Compromise Or adapt As you like to use That after his Wife gives birth To a child Or many children And she She having some Outward changes In terms of her physique And whatever it may be Do you think it's Unreasonable for him To expect her to go back To a particular shape Ooh Unreasonable No He he needs to be Understanding Mm. Right, he needs to be understanding, but um, I think from proper research, right, you'll find, and it's a it's a, it's an honest question to ask for a, a woman to ask herself, right, um, the same way that a man should ask himself honest questions about himself. It's an honest question, like you know, like why do you feel, you know, what is it? Like for example, like do you feel like you feel you're exhausted? You feel you're tired? You feel you don't need to look good for your husband anymore? Mm. Um, you know, do you feel you just need to like, you know, this is me now. I don't care. You're going to come home. This is how you're going to see me. Um, you know, whatever. Um, whether you're attracted to me or not, I don't care. You know, so it's an honest question to ask, right? Because I'm sure, because I'm sure if there was to be any kind of case studies, I think we'd find so many differences. So there'd yeah. be times where, you know, a child can consume the life of a mother so much so where she literally each to their own and each case to their own simply just doesn't have the mental energy and the physical energy to you know make herself appealing or attractive or even do a little thing in terms of what she wears or in terms of makeup to look presentable for the husband because she's just exhausted mm-hmm. right there's other sisters who mashallah hold it down they manage to manage these things there are others who uh, will go even go the step further and will try go back to what they were. That varies according to uh, mental. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a deep, deep topic, Dilly, because many women would argue that the reason why I haven't gone back to how I was before is because you don't treat me good anyway. We're not, we're not, you know, there's certain dynamics, there's certain things that's been said or being done without, you know, within, within our time together. Mm. So it's a very very broad topic and and the reasons why are they they do vary mm. um but th- it's been said many times for example like uh, the most attractive woman might be the woman who um i use the word might she might be, you might be, she might be the woman who not necessarily looks tries to look good for her husband but she tries to look good for herself because he gets the benefit from that Ah, oh, so you're say, you're saying that the 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 the, the, ne- the better thing or the more kind of greater thing would be that sh- she looks after herself for herself. Yeah. Be, and, and as opposed to doing it for the husband, because then that could be like a chore kind it of. Becomes thing. a chore. Yeah. And um, especially if he doesn't treat her right and stuff like that, then obviously it becomes a punishment that you know this is how you're going to see me and stuff like that, and becomes. Problematic. Where she looks after herself because she wants to look after herself. Yeah. And the same will apply for a man, to be honest, bro. Yeah, exactly. So that that's the thing now. So the same, obviously, the same just would have be- to apply to a man. Hmm? The same would have to apply to it a man. You have to apply to a man as well, yeah, definitely. He's got to look he's got to look good. I mean, I know there's a hadith um Husband and wife should husband and wife should look good for each other, right? So it's dress a, as you would like her to dress, smell as if you the way you would like to. So, so, so yeah. it's specific to with dress and smell yeah. and sense. So, so you should yeah. be complementing and mirroring each other. Try to, yeah, exactly. So try to look out, for, um, you know, help each other by you know sort of making those efforts. Mm. And if anybody within a marriage stops making those efforts, it shouldn't be a taboo to talk about it. Mm. Right, it should not be a taboo. It should be something that you should be have that discussion about. Because if you don't have that discussion, the the longer it takes to have that discussion, the harder it will become, uh, and then that's where it can become problematic. What's your thoughts on? Uh, you know, we touched upon it uh, earlier on when we were talking about polygynous marriages. What would your thoughts be on this whole kind of like you know a man not adapting, sticking to this ideal, not necessarily being understanding? 
does that not necessarily relate back to perhaps that man, men, their their aesthetic interest, their outward interest in women, um, they're just genetically made differently. The reason why I say that too is because I recall a question being asked to Nupman Ali Khan. And a sister asked him, how is it and why is it that Allah and the Prophet ﷺ have promised men hurul ain, um, and not only hurul ain, you know, talking about how they look, wide-eyed, wide-bosomed, um, you know, there's 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 many references to what awaits them in paradise. Even your own wife or wives in this world will look next level in the hereafter yeah, in Jannah, inshallah. Mm. How come women don't get? These kind of promises and these kind of like um, b- Bashara and these kind of like glad ties of what awaits them that you know they're gonna have a hench butter with some serious pecs and abs and you know he's gonna be dark and broad and all them kind of things. How come men get those uh, references, very explicit ones, mm-hmm. but whereas there's not anything like that for the women? And not only Khan, I'm not saying he's correct or anything, but it's an interesting point, and that's because you touched upon it earlier. Is that look, Allah knows his creation better than they know themselves. And Allah knows what stimulates, what uh, interests, what triggers, and what motivates men. And he knows what is the same for women. And there is a difference in that. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah. That women are more emotionally committed. They're more. They're, 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 they're more. They're, they don't necessarily. They, they can more quickly look beyond the outward. They are. They, they find it easier and even normal to look beyond mm. the the outward aesthetics of a man, and they quickly, if not immediately, start appreciating and loving other things. Whereas with a man, it's quite common that he needs that attraction yeah, first. Yeah. yeah, a woman would tell you that herself. She would tell you that and she wouldn't have no confidence in you that. I mean, like that's that is what is more important to her. Mm. Right? You know, and, and, and that's the thing, that's what makes a woman and a man different, right? And um uh you know, we that bling of um the line is like yeah. something where it's like you know, I use the term bling and it's yeah. like wow, you know, but with a woman, you know, she she will tell you directly, I'm not I'm not really interested in that. I mean, obviously it's it's completely different, isn't it? Mm. It's completely different, subhanAllah. But um I think the most important thing is, well, one of the most important things is that within a marriage, um, communication is very important, right? So within that communication, um, so much more can be achieved rather than sort of um, maybe making sort of blind assumptions or uh, just kind of just settling for something that you're not quite happy with and stuff like that. And And I think when that happens, then even if a man, for example, is polygamous by nature and even if he you know, as you said he has that attraction for other women and whatever it doesn't matter the main, the main thing is that he can still be happy with his wife and she be happy with him is it not enough and, 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 and this is my concluding point on, on everything that we discussed is it not the case sometimes that the aesthetics and the outward wears off and mm. then you start loving your wife or you start loving your husband for the other things the commitment the sacrifice the compromise uh, the commitment the love how he is with the children, how she is with his family, um, how dutiful each other are, and that kind of stuff just wears off eventually. I mean, it's fantastic that it's there. It should still be there. We should encourage that mutual attraction to still be there to make an effort, etc. Mm-hmm. But is it not just the case that you start actually loving other more long-term, more kind of existential things about what makes a marriage work? Yeah, And that, okay, fine. If you both can both mutually make an effort for each other Or if it's expected more so from a woman to Make herself presentable and attractive and so forth right? Because a man doesn't A Muslim man doesn't have it over his head That his wife might remarry another man But she does have that over her head So is it not just a case where Maybe it's not about mutual attraction And that as the years pass That kind of becomes a secondary lesser issue And they start appreciating just all the other stuff so I don't know, and would that mean in that question that in an ideal world that within a marriage with a, a man and a woman, and after, for example, ten years, simultaneously 
their libido, their marriage, their, their sexual desires just goes down together at the same time and then it reaches their peak and like, you yeah, just that, don't do it anymore. Nah, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, rather what I'm saying is, bro, is that this thing about mutual attraction and that, maybe that just wears off, innit? Maybe just wears off. Within the marriage, the husband and wife. Within the marriage, and, and, you, and you, you're in the long run now, man. Yeah. You're in the long run and, 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 and you've, got so, ch- you've got children, life's consumed you and you just... Want to see it till the end? Yeah, but you—that's a given. That's a given. But if you're in a marriage and either you, as the husband, right, your wife still demands her physical rights because she has not lost it and she wants it, right? And he's sort of thinking, "I'm not really attracted anymore," stuff like that. Um, then that needs to be addressed, and the same the other way around as well. It needs to be addressed, and so therefore. Um, the efforts that they could make with to help each other, mm. they could still be happy. And you've seen, you know, that like you've heard it. It does it, it does happen where mm. you got some, people are married for like forty years, fifty years, and they're still physically happy with each other. Alhamdulillah, may, may Allah instill that amongst all all Muslim marriages and couples. I mean, I, mean. Mm. Um, I want to get one thing off my chest, though. And mm. I think it's an important one. Um, I know many sisters may not like it. But it's something I have to put out there. And I, I'm going to address mainly our sisters from the South Asian community. I can't comment on uh, Maghrebis, Khalijis, West Africans, Turks. I can't comment on because I don't know what the situation is there. But it is common amongst South Asian women that, you know, mashallah, they will dress up for weddings, for dawats. So like uh, dinner events, lunch events, you know, invitations with families, Eid, work. But the husband don't see any of that at home. Mm-hmm. So she would look her best. She'd look her 10-10 in every other environment except for her husband. Yeah? Except for that environment that where she should be looking 10-10 at home. But for Eid, for weddings, for all for, for family gatherings where there'll be Sirat al-Rahim and non-Mahrams around, she's looking her 10-10. You know the funniest thing? And the only time he gets to enjoy that 10-10 yeah. is in them situations. Yeah, the funniest thing is how fast she changes down. Like she goes to an, a, an, a, an event, right, a function, and oh. he's at home, and she'll come in and you go, wow. Oh. <laughs> she changes so fast. Wow. <laughs> it's but like, everything's, wow. Everything's, everything's just off, innit? Fast. <laughs> yeah. Like this, right? And then it's like, so finally, it takes. Ages to put it all on and it's gone in a second. The shalwar kameezes, the lengas, yeah. the saris, the high heels, yeah. you know, the, the extensions, the eye, the eyelashes, all them things, yeah. all them things, the contour, it all goes yeah. on. As I, wallahi, sisters, if you're watching this from the South Asian community, I beg you don't come lynch me. What I'm saying is that <laughs> it is a common trend that I've seen. Uh, within our communities Happens everywhere and, and, don't and, it? But I can't comment Because I'm not observed yeah, it. Uh, yeah, observed it. So, so I think there needs to be An element of fixing up there As well That if that, if that yeah. is something That's happening That Yanni Give give, give, them, give your husband Yanni Some of that goodness uh, In the home environment You know what I mean Instead of him having to Turk for the next Eid party Or the next Dawit and that Yeah uh, Take her out for dinner more Isn't it Yeah take her out for dinner take more Take her out for dinner more Okay And stuff like that Because um Uh yeah, it's an interesting thing. I used to make a joke before when I used to do um, uh, some of the matrimonial stuff. Hey. It's like, you know, there should be a good gap from the beginning, you know, when you first get married, to when she brings out her house mumu. Hmm. What's the house mumu? <sighs> just use your imagination, man. This, like, this old garment, it's just like a one piece or something like yeah. <laughs> this goes on. This mumu is like... Oh, like a maxi or something. I don't even know, call it what you want, man. Yeah. But it's like... There should be a given amount of time because it's like, wow, when that comes, it's like, you know, because, you know, you know, but look, men do it too, right? Men do it too, but we're having this joke on, on the, from the male side, obviously yeah. we're both men here, but, you know, obviously we throw on our stuff, but maybe they don't, they don't, wives don't mind as long as our socks are not stinking and they stand up in the corner yeah. and stuff like that, you know, whatever. But, you know, it's that whole eye candy thing, which, which you know, obviously men enjoy as well. And uh, yeah, there should be given time. And I used to make that as a joke. You know, give it a bit of time before you sort of pull that out. And um, you know, because the first time that happened, and he'd be like, "Okay, I'm okay. married now." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> life's kicked in. Yeah, I'm married now. Yeah, the reality's kicked in. I'm married now, and you know, but you know, it's a bit of give and take on both sides. You know, obviously, because you know, uh, and this is what the city will tell you, um, the South Asian ones. But we could put it to the test. But you know, obviously, if you say to him, "Darling, we're gonna have to dinner." 
yeah. nice restaurant and stuff yeah. like that, then she will or she yeah. should do herself up really nicely. Uh, Does so. he have to take her out for dinner for her to dress up, bro? Yeah, that's the question. That's the question. Does he have to? Should he have to? No, take her out for um, dinner, but, but but should he have to take her out for dinner to see her like that? Well, I mean, take this is the argument. Dinner, yeah, this is the argument. The, the thing is, she will say that when she comes home, uh, if she's working or whatever, she wants to be able to, you know, to kick One. back. Okay. Um, and so where's the compromise? Because okay. ho- hopefully there should be a compromise. Where is that compromise? Because that's what she'll be thinking. And, and the thing about it is we're not talking about, like, the first, like, six months or a year of marriage. We're talking about years in. Mm. And if it did happen earlier, then they'll be, okay, wow, well, okay, maybe that's something more we need to address that. But, Definitely. Yeah, but if it happens, like, years in, then you're not really going to be expecting, like, for example, uh, you come home from work and she's done herself up. It does happen. It does happen. And it happens for, you know, for many years uh, and I, I know cases where this is something which happens, but um, yeah, I mean, as an expectation, we it's a, it's an ideal, but mm. nowadays I think we find that there are many more sort of arguments as to like why you know he shouldn't be doing it as well and all that kind of stuff, and you know, so we we've reached sort of maybe interesting times now, um, but it should be something there should be consideration on both sides, and at the same time as well, again, maybe a reminder might be needed, like you know, darling, I love you. I've always loved the way you, you know, the way you do this, the way you wear your hair and stuff like that. And, you know, I really want to see you like this a bit more often. And, and that for that to be articulated in a nice way. In a nice way, yeah, yeah. to be articulated. And, and that way, obviously, she'll understand that, yeah, you know, he, you know, whatever. And, and she'll do it for him. Mm. But when he sort of does it like, like you know, that that moo Yeah, like, that Yeah, that, <laughs> you know, burn it or something yeah. one day or something like that. Right. Obviously, um, so yeah, basically, So basically, one of Hamza's like couched in love, mercy and compassion, yeah? Love, mercy, and compassion, yeah. yeah I, Bro, I, pr- so. I've, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever marital issues the believers are going through to, for Allah to ease their affairs, mm. to rectify the affairs, and to unite the hearts and minds of, of, of the married couples. I mean, mm. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that those who are seeking spouses, that Allah makes it easy for them to complete their half their deen. And for it to be uh, an attainment to get to Jannah, inshallah. I mean. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we, me and you both are protected from the comments that I'm going to get blasted on this podcast. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean <laughs> Jamal, yeah, it's an absolute pleasure having you on, my bro. It's a pleasure to be here, Dili. Just like you for having me. And, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this, uh, and I don't want to throw dirt on your face. Um, this was a special episode for me. Besides the fact that it's the first one in like 56 episodes that we had to refilm, um, <laughs> I've always found you to be someone who I can speak openly with. I Can I just say, Dilly, Jazakallah for that. I just remember, like, when I told Dilly over the phone that I'd uh, lost the footage, I deleted the car by accident, uh, and Dilly goes, "Wallahi, bro, I just feel like smashing my phone against the wall right now. I ain't gonna lie." <laughs> that was too funny. When you said that, I just thought, "Oh my god, Dilly is proper vex, man." Uh, That's because you don't have a track record of doing these things. Never done it before. It was the first time. So uh, yeah, man, I've, I've 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 said to my wife and I've said to others that you fall for me. Somewhere between the spectrum of a brother and a dad, in, in terms of how I speak with you and engage with you, my brother, and I pray to Allah He gives you a long and virtuous life. I mean, I mean, and you too, bro. Mashallah. It's been a, always been a pleasure working with you and working under you under you when you was my boss at one time as well in Ayera. Yeah, mashallah. Yeah. Some very pleasurable uh, memories. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, may your work continue. I mean, I mean, I mean, my brother. But you got rid of my intro card, though, bro. For that's for season two, though, isn't it? Muslims out of order. Yeah. Muslims out of order. order. Yeah. Like, you, you got the whole podcast, you yeah. got everything, the more podcast done, yeah. and it goes and removes my intro. But I'll tell you what happened there, then. Mm. Be- because obviously the initial was the partnership with the Mad Mumluks. So we had to make sure that we're Brits to, to kind of differentiate between us and the Yankees. But obviously, since we parted from the Mad Mumluks, that collaboration, may Allah bless them and their work I as mean. well. I mean, top brothers, my day one, sim, big up. We had, we're now exclusively Brits, isn't it? So there's no need for laws and the and the upside down Union Jack and them kind of antagonisms, you know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, yeah, Mohsin, um, good on the new intro, bro. But uh, that kind of the national anthem with the upside down Union Jack was was a classic. That bro. was the original. That was the original, man. Listen to Mohsin now, the original. Yeah, Just trying to keep original. myself out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and brothers and sisters, we're gonna have Mohsin on very soon as well. Can't wait. Dao Digital, and he's sitting there with with a face which I hope you guys could see right now, and that's <laughs> gonna be a very interesting one. But anyway, brothers and sisters, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Uh, 
like this video, subscribe to the Five Pillars YouTube channel, share the video, and until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Blood Brothers Podcast, Five Pillars Production.